again to see if this works. Okay, so we're ostensibly live again. But for, if anyone's joining in on YouTube right now, we're just going to test and make sure that that's going well. We have a little bit of a tech issue today. All right, let me check something. And uh, see what's going on. Oh, yeah, we are. We're good. So. <laughs> For everyone joining us on YouTube, for teachers that are live with us, their classes, and, and everyone who's very confused, I apologize for the mix up. For whatever reason, when we went live, it shared our last presentation instead of this one. So, to reintroduce this whole program, welcome back. Um, so, my name is Jesse, and I'm with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We've been doing zoo programs over the last two months, and I'm really excited to bring them back today as we highlight zoo crews. So, we're going to highlight animals that live in groups, why they live in groups, why they're so cool, and some really of the, the zoo's coolest and most fantastic animals. We've got a whole bunch of live teachers and, and families joining us from across Canada and the States, so a huge welcome to them. For everyone tuning in on YouTube, we are starting fresh, so apologies if you're joining us in the middle and you missed the first few minutes. It's all good. We're starting from the beginning. Um, a quick note, you can share questions on YouTube. You can also join us on Slido with the event code CREW, and that will allow you to share questions, take part in some interactive polls and quizzes. All right, now with feeling, uh, we're going to join in with the zoo again. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary Ellen, and I look forward to your introduction again. Uh, take us away. Perfect. Here we go. Take two, everybody. All right, so like Jesse was saying, my name is Mary Ellen. I'm one of the programs coordinators here at the Toronto Zoo, and I'm so excited to be able to take you guys around our African savanna um, and learn about some of our animals uh, who are very social and why they might be social and the benefits or uh, cons of being a social animal. Um, so before we get started, I always just like to point out that we are currently closed to the public, uh, but just because we're closed doesn't mean we have stopped caring for the 5,000 animals that call our zoo their home. And as we walk around today, we're going to see some of the most social animals the zoo has um, and figure out why they're like that. To get us started, though, we're going to do our riddle of the day. So we're going to go through the riddle together. I'll give you a little hint at what it may or may not be. Um, and at some point during my talk today, I am going to say the answer. If you hear the answer and think you know what it is, write it in the chat bar or in the Slido chat bar, and Jesse will give you a shout out at the end of the video. All right, let's go through it again here. So don't tell these ladies what to do because they're in charge of the whole crew. Don't worry, the guys aren't at a loss, though in this system, the girls are boss. So as we walk around, I will be saying the answer to this. Um, but just to give you a hint, it's not going to be like an animal's name, like a penguin or a Watusi or anything like that. It's going to be a word or term used to describe multiple animals who all do or have the same behavior within their grouping. All right, so let's get us started here. So like Jesse was saying, we're going to be learning about zoo crews and animals in their group. Now with everything in the scientific world, or really just world in general, there are different levels to everything around us. So when you think about it, you can have a social animal. But again, there's these distinct kind of steps up the ladder of what makes a true social animal. We're going to kind of explore those levels today um, and figure out what makes them different from each other and why those differences are important. So our first animal right now, we are going to take a look at our African penguins. So we're going to nice little zoom in on here. Uh, so these are our African penguins. They're quite small. Uh, most people get kind of confused when they see them. Uh, but African penguins are a little bit tinier than, say, like an emperor penguin or anything like that that most people uh, traditionally think about. Now penguins are kind of a fake grouping um, and I say this with love they are quite cool animals and I do very much enjoy seeing them uh, but their fake grouping comes from they look like they're a group or, or a clan or a, a gang hanging out together uh, but really the only thing they share is space. So they're kind of at the lower level of our groups of animals and their socialness scale um, and that's because they'll hang out together and there's some benefits we're going to get into about why they hang out together. Um, but other than that, they feed alone, they parent their young alone, um, and anything they need to do for themselves, they'll do on their own. They really just cluster together uh, during the day to hang out with each other, and they'll kind of stay near each other when they sleep. Now, the benefits of sharing space for animals is it do does give you some protection. So uh, in colder uh, parts of the year, these guys will huddle together for warmth, um, and they'll share who's on the outside of their huddle. Uh, to make sure that they're all getting an equal turn to be on the nice cozy inside um, and they'll also make sure the young are protected so that ensures the survival of their species. Um, it's also a predatory defense so when there's more of you in a group you're less likely to be uh, preyed upon uh, because there's more who could defend and attack against the predator coming at you. Another thing is communication. Uh, so even though these guys do wander around quite a bit and move, uh, going back to their grouping, they can uh, relay messages such as feeding grounds, 
uh, if a predator is coming near, they can also all uh, congregate back together at their own breeding grounds. So they really just share their space. They have some talks and communications. Uh, a few minutes ago, right before we were live the first time, uh, these guys were actually giving us some honks and squeaks, which is really cool. So they do a lot of uh, physical displays of communication where they'll flap their wings, uh, they'll move their beaks and heads around, but they also are quite vocal animals as well. Now, something that's just kind of cool about our penguins here at the Toronto Zoo, and when you come, uh, when we reopen and you're able to come back and visit them, a way you can tell our guys apart is uh, they have little bands on their uh, wings so that when you guys are walking around, you can see all these colored bands and those can tell you who the penguin is, but also who their mate is. Um, if they have a matching armband, it most likely means that they are a mate in pair together and they would probably have an offspring. All right, so we're gonna continue down here and take a look at some of our other social animals. Now, our savanna is a very unique area, part of our zoo. Uh, there's a lot of really cool animals who live here, but the problem is they're a little bit spread out. So we're gonna go and see as many as we can right now, but to make sure that you guys aren't having too boring of a time in the chat while we're walking from animal to animal, we're gonna talk here and we're also gonna start taking questions as we go as well. So if you have any questions from previous videos that we didn't get a chance to answer, or any new questions about our penguins now, Jesse and I are gonna have a little bit of a conversation as we make our way down to our next animal, the Watusi. Fantastic, well, thank you so, so much, Mary Ellen, for kicking us off twice in one session, which is a new record for us, we're really excited. Um, for penguins, one of the things that we've gotten consistently in the past in penguin presentations is where do penguins live in the world? Are penguins only found in Antarctica or where can we find them? Yeah, so that's a really good question. People are actually really confused when they come to the Toronto Zoo um, and we and they ask where our penguins are. Most people uh, don't assume that we say our African Savannah Pavilion. And these penguins are actually uh, from the southern coast of Africa. And a lot of penguin species are from those areas and also they occupy Antarctica as well. So they can be in a couple different locations. Fantastic. Looks like we're getting, we're approaching our, our Watusi now, which is really exciting for anyone who has never seen a Watusi. You're about to have your mind blown. Okay. Yes, they are super cool here. We're going to try and get a bit closer to them. Uh, they've decided to wander off on us here, but hopefully we can still get a nice up close. Jesse's right. They are incredible uh, species. They're a type of cow or bovine. Um, but they have a pretty unique feature. You guys might be able to see as we're coming up on them here. Uh, they have quite large horns coming off their head. We're going to get a close up on the photo here and we'll see them. Our guys have uh, migrated to the back of their pavilion here a little bit or their uh, exhibit, but hopefully they'll come a little bit closer to us. So we're to see a great example of another social species that we have here at the Toronto Zoo. And these guys are so good at it. They were bred for this. So in the wild, these are found in the uh, African plains and uh, savanna area, and they are an animal that's kept by herders. So similar to we have here, we have like people house or farm animals at home. Uh, people will grow and breed Watusi. Now they're bred for two main points. Uh, the larger the horns on a Watusi, the better they are seen to be. So they're breeding, selectively breeding for large horns, but also they selectively breed for animals who like to stay together. So when you come back to the zoo and we are reopened, you guys will be able to see that when you come to this exhibit, our Watusi are almost always standing on top of each other. Even right now, there's three of them all together at the back of the exhibit. They have an entire exhibit in front of them. We'll do a pan across here about their whole exhibit in front of them. And yet all of them are standing directly on top of each other, eating the same grass at each other's feet. And that's because Watusi have been selectively bred over several generations to want to stay together. And that makes sense. If you're a farmer and you're taking your Watusi from point A to point B and you have to travel across the savanna, you're not going to use ropes and halters. You're probably going to just migrate with them um, and use some cues or maybe some dogs or other livestock to kind of help keep them in a line. Uh, problem is, if somebody wanders away from that group, they're more likely to get predated. Like remember I was saying at the penguins, staying in a group, you're a safer together, safer with numbers. So they are looking for the Watusi who like to stay together and those ones get bred into the next generation. So eventually you get a bunch of homebodied Watusi uh, who only wanna be with each other and don't wanna leave each other's side, which is beneficial for keeping them safe on in the savanna. Something really cool about our Watusi here is these guys are actually named after the Simpsons characters. 
Uh, so we have like Millhouse, Mo, Marge, Maggie, um, all the main ones there. We do not have a Homer though. People always ask that as well. Uh, but so those are our, kind of our fun fact about our guys here. All right, we're gonna keep going this way. We're gonna check out another of our social animals. And this one gets kind of a bad rep. Personally, I love the Lion King very much. Even the remake has, always will hold a special place in my heart. Uh, but one thing that's kind of a little bit sad about it is that hyenas get a pretty bad reputation from those movies. And they get that reputation of being scary um, and aggressive and mean and cunning and evil. And really, they're quite amazing creatures who do have a variety of skills that help them survive in the wild. Uh, but they need a lot more love than that than we give them in the wild. All right, we're gonna try and get a close up on one of our hyenas here. If not, we'll head up to our other window viewing area. So in a lot of movies and a lot of pop culture out there, hyenas are seen as just being scavengers. So they will just steal other animals' kills. So they're kind of seen as being lazy creatures uh, because they don't do any of the work themselves. And that's not really true. They are skilled at being a scavenger. And honestly, I'm part of that motto of why work harder when you can work smarter. Um, so in my eyes, hyenas, when they do, or when they're able to take something else's kill, they're just working smarter at their job. Um, but they also are skilled hunters together. Now, hyenas aren't that large. Um, they're kind of a medium size for a predator. So when they hunt alone, they have to take down things that are smaller than themselves. And that's just basic principle. When you think about when you're trying to hunt or go after something, you wouldn't challenge someone to a fight if they're twice your size. Hyenas and predators know that kind of basic rule of thumb. So when they're hunting individually, they have to go for a smaller kill. And when they go for a smaller kill, it means they have to eat more frequently. But if they were to hunt together, they can take down something larger or take away something else's larger food. So they might be able to go after a lion's hunt instead. Um, so in most areas of the world in the wild, hyenas will live in groups together um, and they're actually part of a matriarchy society. So what that really means is that the females are in charge for them. So in their group living together, they'll have an alpha female and they'll also have a kind of a ladder underneath or a hierarchy of the animals underneath them. Now with that does come some interesting properties. As soon as you start to have multiple animals living together, you have to kind of have that top alpha animal. That means you also have a bottom animal as well. Um, and for a lot of animals out there, it's not necessarily the best. You get the last amount of food. You might get kicked out of the uh, sleeping den or anything like that. But it's better to be in a group and be the bottom animal than it is to be out on your own in the wild. Because like you're saying, it's a little bit harder for them when they're by themselves. So hyenas will share space together. They will share hunting and they'll also share their collected kill. So whatever they hunt together, they will divvy that up between themselves to eat. All right, we're gonna keep going around this way. We'll see as we walk and we can get a better uh, photo of our hyena here as well. All right, do we have any more questions, Jesse? Well, while you're walking, uh, no questions jumping out just yet, but I will say we've got people joining from all over. So thanks to all the people who, who navigated that at the beginning and are joining us. Uh, on Slido 2, everyone who's in has been to the zoo before. We have people that are saying how amazing it is, how much they love it, and they miss it. So, again, we've got a lot of people that are going to be the first people back uh, the moment you guys reopen to the public, which is really exciting. Nice. Well, we're very excited to have some. I don't know if anyone was uh, watching in our last week's video in the Wildlife Health Center, uh, but somebody asked one of our keepers that we had from O&D um, about if the animals are missing people at the zoo. And one of their best responses was the hyenas are actually missing people. So that wasn't the hyena we were speaking about, but we do have one who was hand raised. Uh, so she's very people oriented um, and she is definitely missing having those visitors come by. And anybody who walks up to the gate with her, she's super interested in them. She's super excited to see you. So when people do start coming, I know our animals will definitely. All righty. So. We've arrived at our next animals here. If we look up into the back, these are our white lions. So we have three white lions here. We have Fintan, he is our male, he's our alpha. So these guys live in a patriarchy, not a matriarchal society. Um, so we have an alpha male and then we have two females in here. There's one female sitting next to Fintan and the other female who I'm presuming is Lemon, that's her name. She is just on the other side of the big rock over there. She's just kind of hanging out by herself. Now, the reason I can tell that that one is probably Lemon and not Macaulay, our other female, is because, because they live in a group, 
they also have that hierarchy. So I mentioned that Fintan is at the top of the hierarchy. He is the man in charge and he has his females around him. And just by knowing these guys, I know that Macaulay is his more favored female. Uh, so she is gonna be who is with him on a more regular basis um, and kind of near him, closer to him. They'll cuddle up next to each other. Well, Lemon, she's there. I like to think of her as like a fun aunt in the situation. She's kind of there, but Fintan doesn't like her as much. So she's more off her own sometimes. Now, like our hyenas, lions have learned that if they hunt together, they're able to take down significantly larger kills together as well. And it's actually the females in this society that will do the majority of their hunting uh, for the pride of lions around them. So they'll go off and hunt and they'll bring it back and they will share it with whoever is back uh, at their resting spot or their den or anything like that, their pride rock, if you will. Um, Fintan will get involved though, if they're trying to take down something extremely large, like maybe a uh, giraffe or something like that, if they're going for a really big kill that day, the males will get involved. Obviously they are a lot bigger than the females. Um, so it is beneficial to have their strength in the hunt. Um, so these guys will again occupy that same space. They'll occupy their uh, food or they'll share their food together and they'll share their hunting. They do a little bit of shared parenting, but not as much as you might see in animals like giraffes who will all take care of the same young together. Uh, when a female lion is pregnant, she'll actually go off on her own for the first little bit and she will kind of hide, keep her baby safe. They're born uh, looking a little spotted with their eyes closed. So they're pretty vulnerable when they're first born. Um, and she'll take care of them by herself for the first little while. And once they're a little bit bigger and playing around, then she'll bring them back in and meet the rest of the pride. Uh, she'll primarily be the caretaker for them. Uh, the alpha male, Fintan up here, uh, he did have cubs a couple years ago with uh, Macaulay, our female. There was four of them. They were all little boys and Fintan tolerated them. And that's probably the best word to use. Um, he wasn't very uh, fatherly to them, but he would let them wrestle on him. Um, in fact, as well, if you notice a lion's tail, uh, there's a nice little piece of fur at the end of it. They've got some uh, fur and the ball kind of at the end. And when he had the cubs here, his fur was pretty much stripped off of his tail. And that's because the cubs would play with it. And so he would bat his tail around and kind of teach the cubs how to hunt and stalk things moving around them. And so that caused him to lose all of the fur in his tail, but it has grown back since then. Some of the disadvantages, like I mentioned before, oh, it looks like Lemon's coming up over to see what we're doing over here now. Um, a disadvantage of living in a group together is that you have to keep the peace and you have to keep that hierarchy intact. It's very important for their social structure to respect it. If an animal who is uh, lower or anything like that down on the uh, spectrum uh, tries to challenge, it could result in fighting or being eliminated from the group. And you also have to understand the balance between them as well. So we had four cubs who were boys here. Um, and because they were boys, we already have a alpha male here, Fintan. We didn't need any other males. Uh, so when they grew up and they were weaned and they were starting to kind of challenge each other and challenge their father, uh, they were actually moved to another zoo uh, where they could be grow up a little bit more, mature a little bit more, kind of uh, be perfect their lion skills um, and then eventually when they have matured they're going to be uh, given the opportunity to lead a pride of their own which is really cool all right so we're going to keep going this way we're going to take out one more main animal today but i will warn you this beautiful rock structure that our lions are uh sitting on right now it's quite cool when you're in here when the zoo reopens you can walk through and actually see them from the underside but the service isn't the best in here so you'll have to bear with us for a second as Steve and I run through and we check out uh, our baboons on the other side. So come on with us through the cave. We might disappear for a quick second. Fantastic. Well, while you're walking through there, you know what I'll do is I'll pin the video on you guys so we can hopefully see what's going on. I'll just note for everyone uh, tuning in at home that we, again, we've done over 12 programs at the zoo. They're all on our YouTube channel. So if you love today and all the cool animals we got to explore, check us out on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Again, all sorts of fantastic stuff you can check out there. Uh, we got a quick sneak peek of the lions that are really close, which is amazing. <laughs> wow, very cool, Mary Ellen. All right, Lemon's trying to check us out down here. <laughs> so like I said, the animals are definitely missing the people. Um, having the people here is kind of a form of enrichment for our animals as well. So enrichment is, enrichment is something we can give our animals to 
uh, help them have a more natural or stimulating environment while they're in their habitats. Um, and having people walk by, especially little kids, for some of our big predators, um, it definitely acts as a little bit of a, a stimulation for them and can get them kind of excited in their exhibits uh, at the uh, chance of the stalking back and forth. They love to do that to, to the uh, young children, definitely. All right, we're gonna check out our baboons. We just gotta see what the best window is here to see, I think we're gonna come down this way. And these will be our most social animals that we look at today. Okay. Oh, I see a couple in the corner over there and I see a couple up on the logs. We'll give them a second here. Um, as we walk up, you know, they kind of notice us, figure out what's going on. They might come and check us out a little bit more. So we'll wait here a second. If not, we can move to a different window. So these are all of baboons. These guys are a type of primate and they're super intelligent and they have quite a complex hierarchy within their society and their socialness around them. So they do have an alpha male, but they also have a uh, corresponding alpha female. And for most animals in the wild, uh, the way an alpha is determined is it's kind of brute strength for most of, most of them. If you're the biggest and the toughest and you can take everybody else down, you're probably the one who's gonna be in charge. Baboons are a little bit more complex than that though. They take into account your social status. So how much you're liked by the other baboons and also things uh, like your planning and your techniques as well as your strength and how you can lead the group around. Uh, so they have more of a democracy kind of uh, approach to their hierarchy and it can be overthrown pretty easily. When new members come into these groups, uh, they'll try and bond with a higher uh, level female and they'll do this by grooming them. So grooming is a huge uh, social bonding thing. It strengthens those bonds. Uh, they'll pick out little mites and dust and dirt and whatever else they've got in their fur from that day. Some of it they'll eat, some of it they'll just throw away. But this grooming behavior uh, helps for them to become closer as a society, but also it gains favor with each other. So it's like if you uh, the ad is saying, like, I'll scratch your back, you'll scratch mine kind of thing. Uh, these guys take that a little bit uh, pretty literally as well, which is really cool. All right, it looks like they're not going to come any closer to us right now. They're kind of all looking at us right now, trying to check us out, see what's happening. They definitely miss having the people here. They're usually pretty up close in the glass, um, but we're going to keep going. And it looks like it's also starting to rain on us a little bit. So we're going to see if we can find uh, another animal to kind of focus in on for our question part of the video. So for right now, my last kind of farewell to you guys for this video before we go to the questions is I want to tell you my favorite joke at the zoo. Um, so I know it sounds weird, but there's a lot of really good zoo puns out there in the world. And one of my favorite ones, Steve's going to help me with it here. But what is a Watusi wear to bed? I don't know. What is it? A Wawunzi. Yeah, I know it's really bad. You don't have to tell me, guys. You can let Jesse know in the uh, in the chats below, though, how bad of a, a joke that was. But for now, we'll check out our beautiful uh, grubby zebras, and we'll take some of your questions from the audience. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to delete the YouTube chat bar just so that I don't have to deal with the inundating uh, uh, of comments on that joke. Um, but yeah, we're about to dive in with questions, guys. Thank you so much for an amazing presentation, Mary Ellen. Thanks for everyone for joining in after that mix up at the beginning. So a few quick notes. I'm going to go to all our live groups for some questions. I'll take a few from YouTube and on Slido, I'll take our most popular ones. For everyone on Slido too, I will be starting the quiz in just a few seconds. So I hope you guys are ready for that. So I'm going to share our most popular question on Slido as I begin the quiz. Um, and it's Ethan from Boston joining us again. Uh, and he wants to know, Mary Ellen, what is your favorite animal at the zoo? Ooh, my favorite animal. Well, I feel really bad saying this in front of our zebras. Uh, their ears are all on us right now. But my absolute favorite animal of the zoo is our giraffes. I absolutely love them. I've had the opportunity to work with them in the past, which was really cool. Um, and actually right now, our female giraffe, Mustari, she's actually expecting a baby uh, pretty much any day now. It could be at any point. Um, and so we're very uh, eagerly awaiting uh, the birth of that baby for sure. Fantastic. Oh, I've offended the zebras. They're starting to walk, they're walk away now. They're upset. Um, yeah. Sorry for printing my video on that one, guys. Um, all right, let's go to Miss Hinson's class, uh, representing Brunswick in Georgia. So Miss Hinson, if you have a question for us. Oh, she stepped out. That's hilarious. Okay, let's go to Miss Teagle's class in Gator Center, Ontario. Hi, Miss Teagle. Uh, Hi. Share any question you'd like. Yes, um, one of my students is wondering if like the groups of like hyenas, 
um, or other animals, do they all have individual names like the leaders of the group? I, I, um, like the hyenas, does the leader have a specific name? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so like if there's, a, well, so they kind of follow all roughly the same system of like an alpha or a dominant uh, animal being on top and then a beta and then like an omega kind of animals following uh, later down in the list underneath of them. Um, but there's different names for groups of animals. So a group of lions is called a pride. A group of rhinos or hippos is called a crash. A group of flamingos is called a flamboyance, which is probably my favorite one that exists out there. Um, so the ranking within them are all pretty universal across uh, the animal world, but each type of group of animal all has their own name. Very cool. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Two quick notes as well. Uh, so Harriet, uh, who's been joining us all month long, just nailed it and, and won our quiz. And Ireland and Collingwood was the first to get our riddle today, which is matriarch. So thank you so much uh, to Ireland. Congrats. And we got the uh, slide over for getting it up. All right. I want to go to Amy's group today. Amy, you need to water down Ontario. Amy, do you have a question? Go for it. So Claire was wondering, um, we were looking at the news and a new a, a tortoise was hatched at the zoo, uh, yeah. the first critic, like an endangered tortoise. And she was wondering why he, they were so hard to breed at the zoo, and maybe a little bit about that tortoise. Great question. Yeah, for sure. So unfortunately, I wasn't a part of the team uh, who did that hatching. Uh, but I can tell you a little bit about our conservation programs and some of the common problems that we do face uh, with breeding animals in captivity like that. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, releasing and breeding of endangered species. We also have another one that's native to Ontario called the Blandings turtles that we breed and release every year as well. Um, and those guys here, and we also do egg collection for them. Um, so part of the problem is finding those species as well. So making sure that you have a genetically viable male and female that you can mate together, um, that they're able to produce a su successful offspring. And then also sometimes for a lot of animals, they need really specific um, temperatures or environments to actually be born in or hatch or emerge. For example, there is a turtle, uh, we actually kind of passed by them in our video last week in Australasia called the Fly River uh, Turtle. Um, and when they were trying to breed them in captivity, they were very unsuccessful for the first couple of tries. And that's because the eggs actually had to be covered in water. And that was something we didn't realize or know about. Um, and so the eggs had to be uh, covered in water and then uncovered for the eggs to actually hatch. So sometimes it takes a little bit of trial and error for us to figure out the best way for an animal that needs to uh, be born. Um, and so very cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. Great answer. Um, let's go back to this for a second. There we go. Um, <laughs> Miss Hinton's class just joined us again, and I want to share their question from earlier, which is with the Watusi, they've got these wild and crazy horns. What are they for, Mary Ellen? Yeah, for sure. Um, so they have a couple different purposes. Uh, believe it or not, they're actually pretty much hollow on the inside. So people always see them and they go, oh my God, that must be so annoying for them to carry them around. Um, they don't actually weigh that much. If they bang together, which because they stand so close together, they often do. It sounds like two hollow buckets hitting each other. So they can be used um, in the human world. They're used as a sign of um, like privilege or uh, uh, righteousness because you're able to breed uh, two together to have uh, larger horns. In the animal world though, they can be used for defense or production and to kind of scare off any predator. Uh, they can also be used to attract a mate to you. If you have larger horns, you might be seen as more attractive to the other females. And one of their main purposes is actually cooling them off. So within them, I said they're hollow. They have a honeycomb structure on the inside and they're actually able to circulate their blood uh, through those uh, horns and those kind of capillaries and actually uh, use them as a cooling off system. So kind of like a mini AC built into their horns. Super cool. All right, I'm gonna to go to Parker joining us live in Ottawa. Parker, if you have a question, man, go for it. Do you have a question for us, Parker? No, that's okay. We can come back in a minute, okay? What I'll do for now is go to Ms. Hartman's group. Uh, so Ms. Hartman, if you have a question to share with us, go for it. Uh, yeah, well, one of our questions I think we briefly kind of went over was about how the animal behaviors might have been uh, changed without with the absence of the visitors, the kids are wondering how the animals are responding to not having people around, wondering if it's kind of like how they're feeling without their friends around. Yeah. Uh, and the second question is, uh, is there any way we can support the zoo uh, during this time with the closure because of the COVID-19, so with the feeding and the maintaining and all that, uh, they must oh, be having a hard time. 
I love so yeah. And so I'm oh, missing Zoom some team. of the people. Zoom yep. team, your, your connection just a little bit iffy. So start that again, if you could. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I can I can uh, answer both of the questions there. Um, as far as the animals missing people, they definitely are animals like the otters. They're very social. Uh, they love to see the people. They love to interact with the children running back and forth with them. So they're definitely missing um, some of the uh, interaction from the humans around them. And the keepers, you know, they like us, but they see us every day. We're not as interesting to them. Um, and some of the other animals probably don't notice as much. Um, but uh, a lot of them definitely do miss having the guests and visitors here. As far as supporting the zoo, uh, so we actually have a wildlife uh, conservancy. We have a Facebook page for it, the Toronto Zoo uh, online and donate to help feed our animals. All of our uh, feed yes, for our animals comes here. from the- As far as supporting the zoo, Yep. yep. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, you can do donations there as well as we do have our online gift shop set up as well. Uh, so if you go to the Toronto Zoo website, you can actually purchase anything from our Zoo Teep gift shop to help support us during this time. Fantastic. So I encourage all our, our teachers and live viewers to do that. It's a really great opportunity to give back to an amazing organization and all they do. Um, I wanted to share a cool question from online. So on YouTube, one of our questions, which is from uh, Sarah, was where do the lions live during the winter? There. Oh yeah. So lions are actually uh, pretty hardy animals. So uh, if you guys remember that red rock you saw everywhere uh, that we have in their exhibit, um, because it's man-made, we did build it in there. We didn't uh, build around a geological feature. Uh, we actually have heating pads in the rock. Uh, so if you come here in the winter time, you'll notice that there's snow on the grass around them, but everywhere that there's rock, it's actually all melted away. Uh, so our lions are able to stay out all year round. The only time they'd ever go in, um, if a really bad storm is going to hit or anything like that, they'd give, be given the option to go inside if they want. Um, or if it gets to, you know, sometimes we get really bad wind chill here, it gets around negative 40 degrees Celsius. If anything like that hits, then they get the option to go in. Uh, but they, they're able to live outside all year round. Very cool. Thanks, Mary Ellen. All right. I want to go to uh, Elena's group. If you guys have a question for us, come on up. Oh, let's just demute your mic. You might have to demute. There you go. You're good to go, guys. Um. So our question was, how does living in groups or not living in groups affect the animals' traits? Yeah. Oh, okay. So like affects their traits. So animals who um are more social, uh, they might have a higher chance of like individual survival uh, for their species. So if they live in a group versus not in a group. Um, being in a group is a higher ability for them to survive. They have more friends around. They all can all hunt together. As far as animals who are primarily solitary on their own, so when you think of tigers or anything like that, those are big cats who like to live on their own no matter what. Um, they're pretty skilled hunters on their own. I like to think of the jaguar as that. They're also an animal who likes to live on their own. And that animal can run, can climb, and can swim. So individually, they kind of get all the skills that they need to survive, which is really cool. So instead of relying on anybody else, they're able to kind of do it all themselves. Awesome. All right. We're going to take a few more questions. I'm going to come to Sophie as a live group in just a second as, as our last live question. But I want to take two quick ones from Slido that are fantastic. So uh, they're both about penguins. Multiple people have been have had popular questions about how old do penguins get? Okay, yeah. So there is a slight variety for uh, different types of penguins because there are a few different species of them. And like we've mentioned in the past as well, there is definitely a difference for if an animal is born in the wild versus um, in captivity. But for these penguins, uh, if they're in the wild, like our penguins, they can usually about 10 to 15 years, but when they're in captivity, they can live uh, up to in their 20s or so. Uh, so they have that health care that they need. We're able to uh, keep them properly fed, get them their nutrition, so they can live a little bit longer here with us. Awesome. I'm so glad we get that message brought up in every one of our sessions, how important it is that the care, whether it's food or medical care that goes on at the Toronto Zoo. Uh, if you guys didn't get a chance to check out our session where we did the behind the scenes hospital part of the zoo, I urge you to check that out when we're done. It's really cool. All right. I love this question because it's uh, ridiculous and it's the best. So Andreas has been joining us all month long. And the question is, do penguins push each other in the water to see if there are predators? <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> so they push in their buddy. Um, I don't know if necessarily to see if there's predators, but I have definitely seen our penguins push each other into the pools before. Um, they're quite playful and I, I feel like they might be a little passive aggressive sometimes. I've seen them walk by each other and give a little shove, definitely for sure. 
Fantastic. Um, and in the wild, have you ever seen a nature documentary on penguins when they have to go out past the sea ice to get to their area where they hunt? They certainly wait for their buddies to go first. It's like they're waiting as long as possible so they don't have to be the first ones in the water. Um, so maybe in one of those documentaries, you'll see one just, you know, put a slipper out and knock the other one into the water. That's a hilarious question. Um, all right, I'm going to go to Sophie uh, joining us in Guelph, Ontario, Sophie's group. So if you guys have a question to wrap us up, come on up. And you might need to, de there we go. Oh, sorry. There you go, you're good to go. What do baboons like to eat? Ooh, baboons like to eat. Mary Ellen? Oh, what do baboons like to eat? Oh, good question. So uh, all of baboons here, uh, they'll eat a variety of things. So they have been known to uh, eat lots of vegetation. So they'll eat uh, browse and things like that that we have here, which are bark and buds and leaves of sticks and plants and trees. Um, so they get that. They'll eat little bugs and insects off of each other as part of their grooming techniques. Um, and they have also been known uh, to get a little bit more uh, carnivorous, I guess I'd say, um, and go for small mammals or eggs of other species every once in a while. Uh, but they do eat a lot of uh, fruits and vegetation as well. Very cool. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Mary Ellen. Um, and what we always wrap up with is that for everyone at home that wants to learn more about what you guys are doing at the Toronto Zoo, where can we send them to learn more about all the work you guys are doing? Yeah, that's perfect. So if you guys want to learn more about what we talked about today or any of our past videos and resources, if you go to the Toronto Zoo website, there's a little tab at the bottom for parent and educator resources. You can check that out. We have lots of cool activities that you guys can do at home or with your students. There's also a Toronto Zoo live cam that we had at our lemurs and we have resources for grade one through six on that, as well as a current live cam at our gorillas. So you can check them out, see what they're doing in their everyday life. Also, we have daily keeper talks on our Facebook page at the Toronto Zoo. Um, and you can check out our keepers at different animals around the zoo every day at 1 p.m. Um, as well as we also you can follow us on all social medias. I'm going to see if I can say this one right this time. Uh, we have TikTok and Instagram and Facebook as well. Awesome. See, you nailed that. If only you didn't tell us that joke, it would have been a perfect session. There uh, we go. Hey, I stand right. by my joke. They're great. <laughs> Bruh, uh, what we do at the end of every session is I'm going to demute everyone's live with us microphones. <laughs> Girls, teachers, if you guys can join me in this huge thank you to Mary Ellen and Steve today for joining us. You oh, are yeah. all now demuted. Go for it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. So appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, for all our teachers, do check out more resources. I'll be sending an email in a minute for everyone on YouTube. Check us out uh, next week, uh, Tuesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern for some more great food sessions. Mary Ellen, thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. It's been great, guys. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Bye for now.